2002's The Transporter is my favorite Jason Statham movie. Born out of film mogul Luc Besson's style over substance mentality, it knows exactly what it is and delivers every bit of it. Car chases, stunts, explosions, fights, and everything else you'd want for a good time. Its approach was clearly European bred, mixed with influence from Hong Kong cinema, and it shows in its more measured direction and charm. It was Statham before his action stardom became a gag. Before directors Louis Leterrier and Corey Yuen lost status, and Besson before he went full Lucy. It was the first true lead role of Statham's career, sharing graphic qualities to the Bourne identity, which came out the same year and had success in its own right. While not exactly original, being heavily inspired by BMW's own series The Hire, or distinctly French-based around that time given 1998's Ronin, Besson had the pieces for success in place back in 1996 when he wrote Taxi. When it released in 98, it featured some of the same hallmarks that would become the foundation for the transporter. Taxi had its own series, offering a blueprint for a successful, if lowbrow formula that acquired a second wind in the transporter. With a capable lead and vision to support it, the franchise was supposed to be a hit going forward. Until... Ugh, until it became a fucking joke. Alright, look, I get it. These aren't thinking men's movies. They're typical action schlock. But the jump from the European-inclined transporter to the Americanized Transporter 2 was one big car crash. And I was the passenger. It was awful, despite still having the core trademarks I expected. It's reminiscent of Bad Boys 2's ridiculousness, which I love, but come on, that's an entirely different breed of film. Not to mention, the Bad Boys series is supposed to be what the fuck it is. Transporter's roots are in over-the-top excess, but at least the first time it had some level of self-respect. What Transporter 2 did was turn it into a brain-dead gimmick. Transporter 3 was somewhat of a return, but still held a lot of the trappings that 2 introduced. I can at least enjoy that one, just not in the same way I did the first. The TV show I never gave a shit about, and I'm gonna be real here, the less said on Refueled, the better. So what was Transporter, in case your broke ass was out of the loop for 20 years? Statham plays Frank Martin, an ex-army veteran living in France doing paid work transporting goods. On the job, he's meticulous, stern, composed, and all business in his BMW while adhering to some strict rules. Whatever needs delivering gets done as long as the clients, or he, don't break them. Yeah, he's that picky. And when he does break one of them, things get hot. It was a small hit when it released and showcased Statham as a rising action star doing his own stunts and proving his worth as a lead. Its French Riviera setting along the Calanque was so alluring and beautiful I found myself just appreciating the aesthetic, basking in it no matter how simplistic the scene. I wanted to live in Martin's house, which I found was in Cassis, France and was of course constructed for the film. Its relaxing vibe, not just with the setting but with the color, tone, and the too late to be 90s cinematicness gave off this truly getaway, if derivative, experience. Then you have this lump of shit, Transporter 2, with returning directors Leterrier and Yuen. It basically EA'd the first movie into something that would appeal more to younger American audiences with its overuse of gags, CGI, an annoying subvillain, and just straight up absurdity. The first one had head slapping moments, but it's got nothing on this. I was 15 when it came out, and even then I thought it was stupid, and I love Too Fast Too Furious, which is basically just as dumb. This is Statham's favorite transporter. If I were him, I'd really think about reconsidering that. I won't get into the entire plot like I've done with other videos recently, I'm just way too burned out for that. So I'll keep it tighter with a few key complaints that downgrade this sequel. In Miami, Frank's now worked a month for a politician and his family as a favor for a friend, doing dull errands like dropping and picking up the son, Jack, while taking it easy. It's a cushy life without the need for high-risk jobs, but not without action to put him back in one-man army mode. The first scene opens similarly to the original, except this time Frank is caught off guard and set up by some PG-13 thugs wanting to jack his Audi. 
The fact that he wasn't aware of his surroundings might make sense after time in a less intense job, but it's in his temperament to be situationally aware. He's never shaken that aspect about himself, and not noticing that an empty parking lot has a bunch of goons ready to carjack him feels out of character. Dumb thugs, too. Regardless, he takes them out without scratching his car or ruining that nice suit. He gets Jack and the movie plays up the two's relationship, but man does it feel off. Statham would admit he doesn't do well with kids or being the family man in movies. It's why you always see him playing an exaggerated version of himself. It's the movie's cheap and easy way of showing Frank trying to have a connection with someone. If only they knew this was the same kid who would be in Meet the Spartans. Okay, so Frank's doing side work, also getting close to the hot mom, but not too close because of who he is. Why? Because of who I am? Because of who I am. Yeah, no. Because of who I am. Because of who I am. Because of who I am. Anyway, while that's going on, a cartel led by top dog Gianni is planning to kidnap Jack and hold him ransom. He spars hardcore so you know he's dead ass. His scheme is more elaborate than just that though. So looking to capitalize on the situation, Gianni gets his girl Lola to initiate his grand plan. Of all the over-the-top characters in this movie, she checks all the boxes. Villain's girlfriend. Assassin. Marketing tool. Crazy bitch. My problem is not medical. It's psychological. It was this actress's first film, yet she has the most energy out of anyone. You just look and go, oh god, they're doing this. They're actually doing this. Whatever cartoony crap was reined in for the first film disappears whenever she's on screen, good and bad. Despite his efforts to save Jack, which means going full transporter on him, Frank is forced to give him up and has to find a way to save the day again. Following the original looked easy to the makers. More stunts, more guns, more martial arts fights, more explosions, more everything. It's a common trap with sequels despite having essentially what people came to see. Thing is, Transporter 2 does all of that worse than the first. It never surpasses the original in quality, wasting its efforts on thrills that undercut themselves several times. They could have taken the sequel in a direction that elevated Frank as a character and the overarching story as a whole. Instead, they cheeseballed their way into something even more nonsensical. For one, production moved to Miami to maintain the paradise setting of the original, but they failed to make Miami this interesting locale. They filmed it during hurricane season, which is a pain in the ass for all sorts of reasons. Two, the color balance and bloom are upped like a lot of films from that era, very Michael Bay-esque. Look how ugly some of these shots are. This fucking piss yellow color grading. So it's all filtered through this processing, making everyone look miserably burnt. Considering it's Florida, whatever. Next, it's apparent, from behind the scenes especially, that no one said no. With a bigger budget and intention of modernizing the film, they went out of their way to incorporate the most far-fetched things they could. None more noticeable as the use of CGI to spice stuff up. I'm talking bullet trails ripped from the Matrix, uncanny valley superimposed faces, helicopters getting blown up like it's GTA, a plane getting thrown around like it's GTA, and even people just hearing shit has to be shown in a convoluted way. It's tactless, tacky, and trite, looking outdated as hell too. It's almost like they built scenes around some of them, like oh man we got this airplane fight going on rolling all over the cabin about to crash in the ocean, and in concept it probably looked awesome. Even when they shot it, they were thinking this tops the original's ending. Then you see it in the movie and you burst out laughing, and I don't mean with them. The movie knows what it is, but the line between endearing and shitty is wide. The first one endeared me to the cheese, the craft in its fight scenes, and the way Frank is able to get in and out of situations with endless stamina and luck. It reminded me of Jackie Chan films where he'd get into danger and have to improvise his way out of it, which is basically what most Jackie Chan films are known for. Granted, Statham is unstoppable, so it takes away a bit of the danger factor. What's the danger here? What compels Frank to do what he does this time? Well, considering what was going on in the US at the time regarding high-profile abductions, kidnapping films were popular. 
It didn't matter the quality, as the execs thought that trend was the right one to follow regardless of how it conformed to the character or story. So Statham has to run around trying to find a kid and then switches gears to an even more convoluted plot. What Luc Besson and his longtime writing partner Robert Mark Kamen wrote was the dumbest shit. Obviously. But if you trimmed it down to the basics of a kidnapping film, it's easy to see how they recycled it for the far superior Taken. And yes, I'd classify Taken and Taken 2 as far superior, but not Taken 3. Here it's like they can't even recycle ideas right. Tarconi, a cop from the first film who's close to Frank, is supposed to be here on vacation but ends up getting sidelined while we have a plot going on. Now he's weird French gag man who gets Frank info somehow and is able to access everything needed to keep the plot moving. Don't think about it or else it won't make any sense. Who the fuck are you? I'm the cook. Even the action is recycled. Corey Yuen was a well-known coordinator in the Hong Kong martial arts scene, working with plenty of recognizable names over several decades. So the guy was no slouch when it came to knowing how to choreograph and make a memorable sequence. Yeah, he fucked it all up by directing Dead or Alive, but I'm not focusing on that. What Yuen does is map everything out with his own crew to show the execs a complete video template on what the scene would look like. What he didn't tell them was that some of these ideas were already done 20 years ago in his own movie, Writing Wrongs. I'm not even joking, and it's probably not the first time he did it, intentionally or by sheer coincidence. But no one's going to double check something like that unless you're a real dick when it comes to finding stuff no one looks for. I admit my position is a bit loose here, especially since Yuen didn't write the damn movie and Leterrier should get most of the directorial blame. But I couldn't help noticing the similarities. I could go on and on, but I'll wrap this up by saying Transporter 2 stinks. It always has. It never should have been made. They forgot what a Transporter movie was supposed to be, derailing the franchise into a pit of parody. I'll watch the original any day and Transporter 3 once in a while, but that's it. It's riddled with plot holes. The action isn't worth sticking around for. My eyes get sore after staring at it for too long. And I never really cared about the kid or the plot. If I wanted to see fun Statham sleaze, I'd put on Crank, not this. Besson clearly didn't give a shit. Most of the fights are lame and anticlimactic. The soundtrack is forgettable. The comedy is weak. Miami looked trashy. The mom was hot. The other was not. And if I had a copy of this, I'd destroy it on the spot. 